Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is James Jordan, and I am coming to you from Parterre Saturday Afternoon, which is a weekly uh, online radio show via YouTube with a little bit of video introduction and introduction uh, by me, James Jordan, uh, the editor and publisher of Parterre Box, the queer opera zine, which can be read online at parterre.com. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance uh, because we do have some slight technical difficulties this afternoon having to do with bit rates, uh, which may cause your picture occasionally to freeze for just an instant. I don't think this should be a problem. If there is any problem with this, um, I'll go back and rectify it later. Um, I've been moving a lot of things around in my apartment, lady, and uh, one of the things I've done is moved my computer and moved my router and I'm going to be needing a couple of new cables to make sure that everything runs exactly as it should be running. Uh, enough technical jargon for right now. Um, I'm very happy to bring you today um, a wonderful, wonderful live performance of Il Trovatore from 1974. Now, why Il Trovatore? I will tell you. Um, at long last, after doing this show for about two months, I finally decided to settle on a format, and that format, I decided to settle on that format, um, is to follow um, a narrative in the novel Mardu Gorgias by James McCourt in which he describes the career, or at least part of the career, of the most fabulous diva of all time who, in order to celebrate her 40th birthday, uh, announces that she will sing 40 new roles in the course of a season. Obviously an impossibility. Um, so she lists 40 of the greatest roles in opera that she will t take on for the first time in her in her 40th birthday season. And one of these uh, one of these operas she's going to be doing is Il Trovatore, but she will be alternating the roles of Leonora, the soprano, and Azucena, the mezzo-soprano, in this opera. Um, she will obviously not be attempting to do both of these both of these roles at the same performance. Um, uh, it's, it's, it would be quite a stunt if anyone ever tried to do that. I don't think anyone has ever tried singing Leonora and Azucena in the same season. Um, uh, however, uh, even though we don't have that kind of feat going on today, we do have a really spectacular performance. And in in lieu of Mardu Gorgias, the, the, the protean and most fabulous of all divas, we have two pretty fabulous divas of our own. Uh, we have Renata Scotto in the role of Leonora in Trovatore. And I think this is the first season she was singing this role. I don't know that it's necessarily her role debut. And we have Shirley Verrett in the role of Atsuchena. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about Miss Verrett later, but I'd just like to talk a bit about Renata Scotto, who is my favorite singer of all time. Um, I heard her in the role of Leonora in Trovatore in May of 1977 on the Met Spring Tour. Um, I heard her two seasons in a row on this tour. She, um, she traveled with the Met on tour in 1976 in Il Tritico, and I've talked about that before. And uh, this season, in 1977, she toured with Il Trovatore and Le Prophète, in which she sang the role of Bert and completely walked away with the show. Um, so it was a really a spectacular, spectacular feat. Uh, she was alternating a, a relatively light role, the Bert, and then the, the heavier spinto role of uh, Leonora and Trovatore. And it was really, uh, both of them were amazingly sung. Oddly enough, I remember the Prophet better than I remember the Trovatore. Um, I think I just remember that Scotto singing was generally excellent. And, you know, she had her, her, her usual stylized stage plastique that I enjoy so much. Um, but the thing that I remember most about this performance, and this is a piece of absolute trivia, is that um, Scotto sang um, uh, Scotto sang this role opposite Fiorenzo Cossotto. And uh, I want to say Matteo Monaguero, but I might be wrong. Um, but the tenor was going to be Carlo Bergonzi. The tenor was announced to be Carlo Bergonzi. And then we got an announcement before the curtain that Mr. Bergonzi had been taken ill and the Met had sent an emergency car out to pick up the cover tenor, Giorgio Casalato Lamberti, who was visiting the Alamo. We were in Dallas at the time. Uh, he was visiting the Alamo and they sort of bundled him into the car. And the announcement said, now you have to understand, Mr. Lamberti has not only not rehearsed the opera with his cast, but he has never seen this production before. So um, what I remember best about this performance was that Madame Scotto and Madame Cassotto were the soul of graciousness in assisting Mr. Castellato Lamberti on stage. I can remember um, 
they had their own 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 ways of indicating to him what his blocking was that um, Miss Scotto would catch his eye and then glance over to the bench where he was supposed to sit or glance over to the platform where he was supposed to be uh, resting whereas uh, Miss Cassotto always a more direct artist would simply gesture where she expected him to go next um, they were both very lovely about this so um, as far as the singing goes I can't say that I remember how well Scotto sang this um, except that she did sing the Damor Sulali very quietly and very sort of raptly. And um, it was an example of what I used to call her, her, uh, her um, calculus place. I, um, I, I don't know why I call it the calculus place, except that it, it, she went into this sort of zone where it was like she was trying to do calculus in her head. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to calculate in your head, and so your eyes sort of go out of focus, and you're... you're you, you sort of lose contact with your surroundings because your mind is working so hard. And um, uh, this, I'm sure, has something to do with the technical way Miss Scotto sang the Trovatore. She had a very extremely meticulous and uh, um, uh, detailed way of doing it. And so I'm sure she had to think very carefully how is this note placed? How is this note placed? Um, it wasn't distracting because, you know, Leonora is supposed to be distracted anyway. So it's certainly read as that. But it was, it was fascinating to watch the craft of what she was doing. Um, so that's what I can say about Renata Scotto in this role. Um, it was not as major a role as some of the others as she did. She sang Trovatore here and there for about three seasons. And I think when I heard her in 1976, this was about the end of her career in this role. I don't think she sang it again, sorry, in 1977, in May of 77. After that, I don't think she sang it again. Anyway, we're catching her at the other end of her Trovatore career in 1974, when she sang the role in Paris with uh, uh, Shirley Verrett, James King, and Matteo Managuera. Roger Soyer, no less, is Ferrando and uh, the uh, conductor is Renaud Giovanetti. So let's hear the first act of Il Trovatore from Paris in 1974. Um, okay, let, let, let me work on this. I'm not really sure what the issue is, but I will be getting the uh, Act of Trovatory online for you in just one moment. Um, just a bit.
So that is our first act of, or rather our first half of Verdi's Il Trovatore as performed in Paris in 1974. Um, I got a number of updates <laughs> uh, during the first act um, of um, some mistaken impressions that I've given. Um, the main one is that um, the baritone in this performance is apparently Piero Capuccilli, not Matteo Managuera, two very different artists on the documentation. I have in this recording um, listed the artist as Managuera, but the Paris Opera archives do not show him ever singing this role of De Luna in Paris. So um, uh, let's just say it's Piero Capuccilli and enjoy. Uh, it makes the, the cast even even a little bit starrier than it already was. Um, uh, Trovatore was a, a big attraction in Paris for uh, the early, in the early 70s. Uh, all, the, all the major singers performed it there and um, this is one of the starriest casts of all. Um, another another bit I guess I should bring into this is that uh, I was reminded that this was a spectacular season for both Scotto and Verrett, our two leading ladies in this performance, um, that um, they both had spectacular Met successes that same season um, in 1974-75. Um, if that's correct. Um, Renata Scotto, the same season she sang this Trovatore, also uh, jumped into several performances of Vespri at the Met that she was not scheduled to do, jumping in for another singer, and had a huge success that really relaunched her Met career, that was the, the seed of her, her, her second half of her career at the Met after her first, uh, her first era as a lyric coloratura and coloratura soprano, that she came back as a, as, as a uh, soprano dramatica da Gilita and uh, uh, did Vespri and uh, later even Trovatore as I, as I mentioned earlier um, she sang Trovatore at the Met in 76-77 including a tour that took her to Dallas and um, I uh, saw her in Dallas performing this role uh, Shirley Verrett of course in 1974 performed uh, uh, Cassandra and Didon and it, it in various performances of Le Troyen at the Met, including at least one performance in which she sang both roles and had a ginormous success. So uh, this was a real banner year for both Scotto and for Verrett. Um, I am a huge fan of Renata Scotto. I am not as huge a fan of Shirley Verrett. Um, my experience with her in the theater has been sort of mixed. Um, uh, I, I heard her I guess a little bit later in her career that I started hearing her on stage, she came to New Orleans Opera twice to perform Carmen and Tosca. And while both were very sumptuously sung and um, with, with a, a rich, radiant voice and, you know, great generosity and, you know, all these other things that we, we talk about, um, there was just something not there. Um, she was not, in my opinion, a real stage animal. She um, sort of... As, a, as a, a colleague of mine once said about another artist performing Carmen, it's not so much that she performs Carmen, but she demonstrates how she would perform Carmen. Uh, and so it's, it was more sort of a, uh, a walkthrough of who Carmen was, and especially, and uh, who Tosca was. Um, not the most interesting performer as far as a dramatic artist, though, of course, very beautiful singing. Um, uh, later, later, after I came to New York, uh, Verrett sang Azucena here, which was really quite late. She went in as a substitute, as I remember, for the mezzo-soprano Livio Budai, who sang a new production of, of Trovatore in about 1989, I guess, 88, 89, um, opposite Joan Sutherland and Luciano Pavarotti. And Miss Budai, though she'd had successes in uh, all the great capitals of Europe and all the other things, um, she did not have a success in New York. And so the, so, so the WAGS story went um, that uh, 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 on the opening night during the applause after the performance, um, uh, L L Madame Budai, Livia Budai, uh, claimed that she heard the audience calling out her name and she wanted to go out and take another solo curtain call. And someone had to explain to her that they were not calling Budai, Budai, but in fact they were yelling, Boo, die, Boo, die. Uh, apocryphal, but I'm sure it's a lot of fun. Um, anyway, uh, Shirley Verrett went in for Madame Boo, die, and uh, uh, I think uh, she went for two or three performances to, to fill in. And this was re relatively late in her career. Again, this enormous voice, very beautiful sound, 
Um, and I just didn't see Azucena there. She just, 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 did, just didn't get it. Um, I think her, her sum total of her characterization was that she had a limp in uh, in the second act, and which to me looked like her foot was asleep. And then she did this big, wild cackling camp laugh at the end. Um, you'll remember in that old production, it was like six or seven Met productions ago. In that old production, there was the, it was a whole flight of chrome-covered stairs. And at the end, one of the stairs sort of pushed out like a drawer and a giant flame came up out of it. It was like a sort of a, a, a sterno drawer. And it just about singed Miss Verrett, but she managed to get off a wild cackling laugh anyway. And then I think the last time I saw her in a staged opera performance was in Sanson et Dalila. And again, you know, blah, 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 singing. However, it was, it, it was an almost astonishingly camp moment when she was singing Mon Coeur Souvre Ta Voix, and she was, you know, reclining on the divan as one does. And um, she was wearing a, a skirt that wrapped in the front with a split, with a, with a slit in the skirt. And uh, she was lying there, you know, um, rolling out these low mezzo phrases. And the skirt separated slightly and exposed part of her leg. I mean, you know, really not much above the knee, but it exposed part of her leg. And she very primly took the skirt and folded it back over so that her leg would not be exposed to Samson. So I think that uh, that sums up my experience of Shirley Verrett as a theatrical artist, again, as, as, um, as a voice, as a singer, and as a musician, and there's nothing to fault. So having done all this and having, having had my babble for the day, um, and uh, with my apologies for the various technical issues that may be besetting um, this week's performance. Uh, this one is, I think, worth it. Uh, uh, Renata Scotto, James King, Shirley Verrett, um, Piero Capuccilli, as it turns out, and Roger Soyer in Il Trovatore. And we will now go to Act 2, and I should tell you, speaking of technical difficulties, that the source tape for this um, lost a couple of minutes of the beginning of the second half of the opera, the beginning of Act 3. So we lose a bit of soldier chorusing, but we do pick up on a soldier chorus and we continue through this really remarkable performance on through the end. And so now, part two of Il Trovatore. <laughs> No! 
well, I didn't see that coming. Uh, there, there we have the uh, these the so-called Paris ending of uh, of Il Trovatore, or I suppose uh, as it would have been Le Trouver. Um, uh, that's the first time I've heard that ending in, in, in a live performance, and I have to say it's a terrible idea. It really doesn't work at all. Uh, <laughs> well, so um, it's it's uh, it's a little startling to have that um, reprise of the Miserere at the end of Trovatore. When you're thinking, you know, we're going to be rushing to a finish. Um, I, I wonder, I wonder uh, what Verdi was thinking when he did that. Anyway, um, it was very well sung by uh, Renato Scotto, James King, Shirley Verrett, and Piero Capuccilli, and Roger Soyer, who also who had a small appearance in this act. Um, a, a, a gorgeous, gorgeous story, and it especially is a reminder of what an amazing Verdian um, Renata Scotto was, even though her voice was perhaps a little on the light side for what we think of as uh, uh, Leonora sound. Um, it's just just exquisite singing and just just g gorgeous musicality. And of course, the the really glamorous sound of of the the, the peak of the career of Shirley Barrett, 1974, I guess, was probably the greatest year in her career, though she had many great years. Um, and um, the other singers are, are wonderful as well. And it's it's uh, a wonderful surprise that who I thought was Matteo Managuera who's a very fine artist, actually turns out to be Piero Capuccilli. Um, they were spending money hand over fist in Paris in those days. So that finishes Il Trovatore in, in the way that it usually finishes, with everyone dead, except De Luna. And uh, in this version, there's enough music for him to throw himself off a cliff. So maybe he could do that in, in, uh, in some updated production. Um, as far as Trovatore goes, we're done for this week. We will be returning next week on Labor Day weekend. Um, and um, uh, on that Saturday afternoon, we will be hearing Verdi's Macbeth in a performance TBA. Um, when I say TBA, that's because I haven't quite decided which performance we're going to be listening to, but it will be a live performance. It will be exciting. And it will be, uh, it will be something for you to listen to on Parterre Saturday afternoon, next Saturday afternoon at 2 p.m. Until then, I'm James Jordan. Uh, coming to you from a Parterre Box, the Queer Opera Zine, Parterre.com online, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the weekend. <laughs>